<laughs> All right, welcome to December. It's the December Fool's Day today, I guess. Uh, something like that. Uh, we are. We only have a few classes left, and uh, we have uh, a little bit of ground to cover. I want it. I want us to do a class exercise today that takes us back to the exercise we did the very first day on earned value. And now that we know a whole lot of other pieces about uh, planning and, and uh, uh, managing and uh, the, the uh, risk assessments that go into a project, one of the things that we need in order to track and reevaluate and update risk as, it, as the project unfolds is uh, goes back to earned value management. So we'll do, we'll do an exercise together on that. That'll be the main piece of the class today. Um, Brennan has an excused absence today and Callie is stuck in Reno of all places, which is not a bad place to get stuck, I don't think. She's working actually. Her company down here transferred her up there to cover for somebody that was sick and that person hasn't been back to work yet. So she's staying in a hotel, uh, partying in Reno, I suppose. I don't know exactly. That's what I do, I guess, is en enjoy Reno uh, while I was there. Uh, but we, we tried to get this to stream live for her, and, and I've still got a firewall problem, and uh, uh, we haven't sorted that out yet. If we were a porn site, it'd be no issue, right? You just, you just live stream that thing right out, and, you know, or a church. Churches do it too, but we can't quite get it figured out. Uh, so she's going to watch the video. Uh, like the rest of you have been doing. Thank you. We've had as many as eight people see the video on, on a given, uh, uh, for a given week, and that includes some of the people right here that reviewed something in the video. So uh, if you've been doing that, thank you for participating. I apologize. The quality is something I don't think I could bear to watch for three hours. Uh, so hopefully you're using the fast forward button and picking stuff up as, as you go through it. Uh, but we have requested uh, some improvement in technology. I requested a mic that I can wear uh, so that you'll be able to hear sound better. And we have a request in for a camera that will follow me. I've got one on my back patio that follows the skunks when they go around. So we, we ought to be able to get one here that does that. It's cheap. So hopefully we'll be able to get those two things and that will significantly improve the quality of the video since we're committed to doing it that way, and you guys are taking advantage of that and using that. So um, that is an, another announcement I want to make, so I don't forget it. I'll make it again if we have others that join us. Uh, but I, the next class is December the 6th, next Tuesday, and we, all, we will hold a class, but not here, and it won't be during that time slot. You'll have an assignment in lieu of that class. Uh, the Tech College has their Christmas party that night, and they've allowed us to make online assignments that are relevant to the class so that all the faculty could attend the Christmas party. So uh, that's kind of a lame reason, but uh, we'll have a good class. What we're gonna do, the assignment is going to be, I have a 51-page document that is an interest, interesting reading. I will, I will let's, let's walk through where that's at right now so you have the assignment. Like I said, if others join us, I will repeat uh, this assignment. Uh, the, this is the document. It's NASA's Journey to Project Management Excellence, and NASA thinks enough of project management that they have, uh, sorry about that, they have a uh, organization within NASA that is called uh, APEL. It's called the Academy of Program Project and Engineering Leadership. And this is part of NASA. Their uh, address is appel.nasa.gov. And they are a school. The Academy of Program Project and Engineering Leadership supports NASA's mission by promoting individual team and organizational excellence in pro program project management and engineering. That is uh, a requirement of NASA uh, uh, personnel that they 
uh, have credentials in this school. And so we are going to, uh, to, to read up on a couple of points that they make in their school. Uh, this is six chapters, 46 chapters on page 42, so it's not a enormous document. Uh, they, they go into in various uh, chapters, uh, uh, chapter three, building individual capability, building high performance team capability in chapter four, uh, knowledgeable services, building organizational uh, capability in chapter five. And, and so I want you to go through those chapters and they start it out with why a project academy? Why does NASA have a project academy? And it's because failure is an option. And NASA has had some very, very dramatic failures that have chilled us. We've, we've watched them and, they, and, and they've changed uh, something inside of us as we watched those horrific uh, failures. And failure is an option. And so since failure is an option, it's not the option we want, obviously. And, and so this is about um, you know, failing better, if you want to call it that. And it's, it's written in story full, uh, form. And, and so they're talking about things and situations that have hit the news and we know. Uh, for example, talking about uh, the uh, phone conversation the night before the space shuttle blew up uh, with Thiokol here in, in Utah. And, uh, and the NASA representatives at the Space Center at the Marshall Flight Center, uh, they tell them, talk about those stories. And there's, there's some, what I think is some instructional and some interesting reading uh, in these slides, which, of which there are 51 slides. Uh, and so your assignment uh, between, I'm so sorry. It, it is important, but I'm not going to get it right now. I've got a, I've got a car in a Jaguar dealership in Minna, Winnipeg, Canada, and that's they want to they want to talk to me about it, and I want to talk to them about it as well. But uh, I'll do it at, at, outside of class. So, and they may call again, in which case maybe I ought to put this thing on star. I thought I did that, but I turned the Wi-Fi off instead of the. You got to put your glasses on to do this kind of stuff. So, so this copy of that, I didn't print it in handout form. It is on dashboard. I mean, I'm sorry, it's on Canvas. It's on your dashboard. You go to the project management class like you do. And this one is under files. Open the files. And there is a date of December the 6th class, the NASA, NASA project management. The file is right here. You can, I allow you to download that file if you want to, to have your own copy, or you can call it up that way and read it on Canvas. So you can, you can access it on your phone, or you can access it on your laptop. Your assignment will be to read that, and I want to know the top five takeaways for you. And we'll talk about that in class on Thursday, uh, a week from today, uh, a little bit about this this uh, the principles of what they're what they're doing and what they're teaching at NASA and we want to be at least as good as NASA as we can so we'll have some conversation about that so the assignment to be clear read that devise your five top takeaways from it there's not a right or wrong answer in that it's what what struck you those can be five bullets five numbers in a numbered list you can write five paragraphs if you want to write about it uh, and, and help cement in your mind what your thought processes are and what your learning processes are. Uh, that's your call, however you do that, but I want at least one piece of paper, not, uh, could be electronic, turned in on canvas, uh, your, five, your five things, okay? So that will be in lieu of driving to school next Thursday, next Tuesday night, okay? So I will, after class today, I'll see you next Thursday. And, and so uh, we will talk about that assignment. And I think you'll find it interesting. I, 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 uh, I really do. All right. Away from that and back to where we were, which I think is right here. No, 
All right. Tar starting the topic of execution, you know, we've spent so far a lot of weeks talking about planning. And, and you know, planning is the important thing. Uh, execution, obviously, is critical in a project. But the planning stage, I think that, that I, I remember kind of learning a lot about planning when I was studying uh, the, some of you may remember, uh, most of you I guess won't because it happened too long ago, may remember a, back in the day we used to get air, air, airplanes hijacked. Uh, that's, uh, you, you read about it in history, most of you, uh, that was kind of solved before uh, you became adults. But it was a world problem. We had aircraft being hijacked and much of the hassles we have at airports today is because of that. And it was a pretty, pretty common thing. Airplanes just got hijacked. And we invented air marshals to ride airplanes and we put uh, uh, soldiers at airports and most international airport, airports today still have soldiers at the airports uh, trying to keep people from hijacking the airplanes. And there was an incident where a, a 747 full of people was hijacked and it was, it landed in the middle of Africa, Antigua I think was the name of the airport, uh, in the capital city that they, that they ultimately landed at, demanding fuel and, and not letting any passengers out, uh, holding all the passengers hostage. The demand, it was an Arab uh, group, uh, the, the terrorist group, I guess is for lack of a better term, uh, that, that, that pulled the move and their demand was that uh, they would release this airplane full of people if the world would release the Arab, all of the Arab terrorists that were in custody in prisons around the world. And they had a list of who was cool enough to make that list to get demanded to get released. And the world responded by, like, hell no, we're not going to do that. And the hostage situation unfolded, and it went longer, and it went longer. And it would be, you know, hours became days, and the demands got bigger. Uh, these people were serious, uh, what they were going to do, and uh, we didn't have an answer. Unbeknownst to everyone, the Israeli special forces, there were a lot of uh, Israeli passengers on the airplane, and Israel took it kind of personal, and they kind of got a history with the Arabs anyway, uh, like thousands of years of it, and they said, not on our watch, we're not going to let this happen, and we're going to, we're, we are going to see if we can go rescue those hostages. And they planned, and they planned, and they planned, and their planning involved they went outside of Jerusalem into a desert area and they literally built a replica of the aerial view of that run of where the airplane was actually at in Africa and uh, all of the, the buildings around it and the other aircraft that were allowed close to it was in a, uh, a hangar area of the aircraft that taxied to the active runway and, um, and where military units were poised to, you know, to fight, and, you know, the plane was surrounded uh, in essence. I mean, they had a cushion, they were told to back off. These terrorists were real. These terrorists were serious. And so the Israelis built a model of everything, and they even put people on board the aircraft, a, a real 747 parked in the desert of, of, of Israel. And they developed a plan of how they could storm that airplane, and that plan included, uh, there was a movie about this, by the way, I never saw the movie, but there was some written documents that I read, and I heard a story from one of the uh, Israeli planners, he wasn't there uh, uh, at, the, at the rescue, but he was one of the planners, and they spent seven days planning this, and then when they, and, and then that, that seven days, they they were taking full inventory of what could be a weapon, what, what are the what ifs of how the people were situated in the airplane. And they just went through every, they even uh, located where the fire extinguishers were at in the aircraft and they could be used as weapons if they needed to. And how, how would they, you know, how would they storm an aircraft? And I think there were 
five or six hostage takers, bad guys that were in there, and, and, and an airplane full of people. So when they actually came to execute, what we're talking about today, they did it in 13 seconds. They were in and out, and it was done. They had them all. No loss of life. That's what happens when you, when you plan well, plan perfectly, and then execute. And it's a story worth watching the movie probably and uh, going back in the history books and looking at it. And, and if nothing else, just kind of reminding ourselves of a time when, when danger was even a little more apparent than it is now. People really were on aircrafts that got, that got uh, hijacked. And I would never was, uh, but, but a lot of people really were. And U.S. airplanes got hijacked. And international flights got hijacked more often. And, and sometimes we didn't even hear about them in the U.S. because it was so common it didn't even really make the news. Yeah, the plane got hijacked. It was headed to Cairo, diverted to Libya, let the people out. Two people died. Everybody else went home. You know, I mean, just that, that was kind of the news. And, and, and uh, uh, we didn't know how to handle that as a world. And I don't know that we figured out how to handle it as a world. But we haven't heard of an airplane being hijacked in a long time. And so I guess we've kind of made some progress on that. But the idea of executing and executing well can only happen if we plan and plan well. So all of these weeks we've been talking about planning. Turns out planning is an important part. And so we definitely want to do that. One of the things that has to happen, and we are going to be the leader of, if we're the project manager, we are going to be the leader of the communication. And if you haven't noticed, uh, we have people that are assigned communication tasks all over. There's an officer of the St. George Police Department who is always the one quoted, Tiffany somebody. And uh, she is the, the public relations liaison officer between the police department and us. And the stuff that the cops tend to t uh, choose to tell us is filtered. And, you know, if the press comes up to an intersection where there's a car accident, they stick the microphone in the police officer's face. He brushes them off and says, you got to go talk to her because she, she makes the story. And I, you know, I got a job to do. I'm, I'm, re I'm reporting a, an accident or a, a crime or whatever it is. So we don't have all kinds of people on day-to-day -day projects in the city of St. George that are talking about stuff. They're told not to so that the organization can figure out what information should be released, what information should not be released, how should it be released, when should it be released, and we have some strategy about how communication is handled. We had that, some of you remember when Elizabeth Smart was kidnapped in our state of Utah. And, and this was a big news deal. This was, we were pretty sure that was a terrorism act at the time, and we had no idea it was gonna unfold the way it unfolded, and, and it's become a case study in uh, these syndromes of hostage syndromes and uh, things that you, you the unspeakable, but it happened right here. And, and, and as that was happening, the very first thing that the cops decided was it was pretty obvious that Ed Smart, her father, must have done something. She, he probably was abusing her. Uh, probably got out of hand and probably killed her and buried her somewhere. I mean, that's literally the, the conclusion that, that KSL TV jumped to and their, their, their coverage was slanted in that direction. He was arrested, actually. And, and, and it turns out it had nothing to do with it. And, 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 and so his family hired a public relations firm, a good one, who became the mouthpiece of the family during the year and however long it was till she was actually found. Found. I had a duplex on 9th East in Salt Lake at about 4500 South. I was working on that duplex on a Saturday morning. Uh, my wife and two kids were there. We were just cleaning a duplex. It changed to tenants and we were renting it to somebody else. And Elizabeth Smart, the wife, and the dad walked down the street 
And he walked up to the apartment and said, are you renting this out? And I said, it's already been rented. And he said, okay, and walked away. And they were standing right there at the sidewalk. I saw them. And they were later found a few weeks after that camping by Kinko's on State Street and in the ditch by the you know, little woods area behind Kinko's. They'd been living there for two months. And right under our noses, and, and, and there was, think about all the communication that needed to happen for that whole thing when it, as it finally unfolded. And there were times when the, the, the wrong stories were being told by the wrong people. Um, the right stories were at sometimes not appropriate to be told. And speculation is inappropriate, leads to miscommunication, misunderstanding everywhere. That was an unbelievable thing that really happened. And you know, she speaks about it. She's recovered. Uh, she travels. She's been in St. George several times uh, since then, and 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 has spent her life advocating against better ways of handling emergencies like that. What was really gross was when they found her. People started just bagging on her and trashing on her, like she did something wrong. Yeah, it was crazy. It was. There were a whole lot of things that were just very unbelievable about that whole thing. I mean, mind-boggling to me. Uh, and and. You know, I was right there. She could have said help, and she could have said it a thousand times to a thousand other people. But she was brainwashed to the point where she's afraid that she would die if she did. And and we don't understand it. Yes. So was Ed Smart her dad, or like? Yeah. Well, no, but she, you, when you said that they came to your apartment, Ed Smart was with her, but it wasn't. It was. No, no, I didn't say that. No, no, it was the he creep. Did, huh? No, it was. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, How about that for a twist? <laughs> Thanks for catching me on it. it. No, Brian, it was uh, the it was the bad guy. Yeah. I forget his name yeah. now. I forget. Brian something. Yeah, I, I don't know. So it was like a foreign kid trafficking. Oh yeah, oh for sure. Yeah, he picked out a new wife for himself, and and his his wife participated in it. I mean, it was it's it's a it's, it's a freak show. Yeah, yeah it was. Um, but they had on long robes, which they stood out in Salt Lake on Saturday morning because uh, they were dressed. Uh, they, I mean, they were dressed to the point where it looked like it was a religious choice. You know, you see Arabs or people that are dressed in, in, in dress of their choice. And I, I, it was weird, but it, it almost kept you from looking further. Did she have a veil? They made her wear a veil, right? I think so, yeah. I think, that, I think that the, the other one, I think they both had a veil. So you wouldn't recognize her? I, I wouldn't have recognized her anyway. I'd seen all the TV shows, but my brain was not thinking that she'd be right there. I mean, you just, it, it was like, you know, you see people all the time, oh, that's funny, it's a doppelganger. It looks like, you know, uh, the quarterback of Green Bay Packers or whatever that one was, you know. And, and uh, Aaron Rodgers has got one. That, he's now famous, right? He goes to the, he's from Germany, and he shows up at games. The NFL uh, is paying for to go to four or five games. and looks just like Aaron Rodgers. It's like, you know, so, you, you know, I didn't really have, anyway, that's, that's not the point of the conversation. The point of the conversation is that uh, when there's incidences, those aren't projects, but when there are incidences that occur, those that know how to handle that have the communication control. So they have communication being funneled through one spot and then funneled out to target groups from that spot. So the messaging is thought about, it's, it's controlled, and it's the same so that we don't have rumors and speculation running amok. And when we don't control communication, weird things happen. When they built the IHC hospital here, uh, the, the IHC does a really good job of controlling communication. They don't want people hearing about people dying in the hospital. You know, and how many deaths occur at this hospital? Uh, that's a real fact. We all know people that died there. And yet nobody ever publishes a number about how many people died there last year. You'd have to dig to find that data because the hospital suppresses that number. They, it, they don't lie about it or hide it in the sense that you can't not find it, but it's that's not their best image. You don't want to, they don't want to be branded as a place where people go to die. They want to be branded as live well. That's their tagline. So they, they want to be branded as a place where you go to get healed, not to go to die. And, and it's the same thing. It's a different spin on it. So you have to control that through communication. The contractor that was building the hospital did not have a communication coordinator uh, when the, this hospital was being built. 
This hospital was dug down three levels of, of uh, depth for three basement levels. There are actually two uh, there, but they built it for a third. They, they were gonna put a gamma uh, rate, uh, linear accelerator down at the deeper end and their cha plans changed and wound up not doing it. It was difficult, but they had to blast a lot of rock away like you do in a lot of places here. St. George, there's, there's, there's rock under this. It was too expensive for us to put geothermal uh, heating and cooling in this college at this site right here because the rock was too expensive to drill through and we had to drill down 300 feet of rock here for this building to be uh, heated and cooled with geothermal. So at the hospital there, they were facing that kind of thing. And an interesting thing occurred they found a bunch of fossils, and there's nothing interesting about that. We've got the dinosaur, you know, uh, fields from Johnson Farms just right there. And so we know, you know, there's thousands of dinosaur fossils around here, tracks and everything. And the, the rumor went up that they were finding these kinds of fossils and st stuff in the, in the excavation for that hospital, and that some of the spores were coming to life. They had been dormant as, you know, molds and those kind of some something. This is Jurassic Park thing, right? And 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 there were there were stories that were going around town from the construction contractors that they were breathing this stuff and it it was it was coming alive and it was it was it was a fungal problem and a, they didn't know what else kind of problem and that that we as St. George City had a problem and and who knows what it was going to grow into and you know it was a it was a little thing like this that went out because the communication wasn't being controlled by the project manager of the construction company that was building the hospital. And not that you don't want to say stuff that's true, but you certainly don't want rumors to go out that don't have fact behind them. And that one was one, was one that had enough fact that the rumors seemed believable. Enough fact was they do find, uh, you know, brachiopods and various types of, of uh, small marine life fossilized in the stone around here when you dig it up. And they were down deep enough that no one had dug there before. So they were finding stuff that hadn't been uh, disrupted or, or seen before. Some of it interesting from a geological history point of view uh, and maybe a biological history point of view. But it was not from a conspiracy theory danger that this stuff was going to come alive and, and we're going to have, you know, dinosaurs growing in the hospital basement and stay out of the hospital basement. So the communication was not controlled. So who's in charge of communication control in project management? It's the project manager or whoever they appoint. And so if most of us will know that we're over our heads. If it's a big project, uh, we better hire somebody that knows what they're doing and pay them to manage communications. Uh, in smaller projects, even if you normally aren't the person responsible for communication in your company, you are responsible for communication in your project. Take that on, that's part of the responsibility. What you wanna do is probably different now as a project manager than normally we address communication. Normally we address communication about, we have different styles. You know, some people are completely need to know basis. I'll tell you what you need to know and I won't tell you anything you don't need to know. Other people are transparent and say, I'll tell you everything. You know, I, I don't want any secrets or surprises. We'll just lay it all out on the table, put it all here. Neither one of those approaches is, is the right one for project management. And so if it's, it, it never is the right approach to lie. And I'll underscore that. You have your own value system of what is a lie. You have to define what is a lie. Uh, is there such, you know, it's a situational ethics question. That's not what this class is about. Uh, from my point of view, it's wrong to lie. Uh, you may define lie differently than I do, uh, but that's a, also another discussion. The purpose of communication isn't to hide the truth. The purpose of communication is to benefit the completion of the project as best you can while you stay within the walls of truth. And, and I think that's, 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 that's my choice. You have to choose what your choice is. But the objective is to 
get information where it needs to get, when it needs to get there. That's what communication is about. So that means different pieces of information are given to different targets. And not, th not different information, but different pieces of information. There are some people to whom it won't be any of their business of what we are paying to get things done. They're not the money people. All they're going to do with that information is bitch and groan and want more for themselves. So we don't talk about money with that group of people. Uh, that's not within their need to know. So that would be an example where we would, there's certain pieces that are confidential in most things and, and unnecessary to communicate. But we have to decide what information gets to who and how. And so the information distribution to the people that need it is critical. It's better to err a little bit on more information than not enough. But too much information can choke the project. And it can get people bogged down with information that they don't need to process, as long as you in the management role of the project are processing. The stakeholders need an altogether different kind of communication. They don't need to know all the facts and numbers and how many paper clips you bought. They need to know bigger picture items. Are we on track? Are we on budget? Are we on target? What, what's the threat that's come up? And so the shareholder and stakeholder communication is, a, is a, a, an entity almost of itself uh, that we uh, would want to, uh, we need to manage. The broad strategies uh, in communication and distributing information is that we need to, to carve it up and split it to what pieces of information are, should be widely disseminated, uh, what pieces should be restricted on a need to know basis, and what pieces of information should be pieced out to the people that just want to know. Uh, there's downside to the want to know information people. One of the want to know people, uh, information people, is the press on a bigger project or a public project. They want to know stuff. And sometimes they, they want to know is because they are going to twist it and turn it around and attack your project with that information. Talking to the press is always risky. And I don't have a lifetime of experience of doing a lot of it. Uh, but I have done enough of it to understand uh, when and where uh, I need to get somebody else that's better at it than I am. Uh, and, and talking to the press about a project can sometimes uh, cost you a lot. I will give you an example. Our company was working on a specific design of microwave antenna that would do some things that had never been done before. Uh, there was a patent on the antenna that had been awarded to the University of California in San Francisco. And part of a patent, if you don't know this, this is interesting to know, when you, did, when you come up with a patent, you draw something, and you submit it for a patent, uh, the patent office sometimes awards the patent, but then you go to try to build it, and you can't build it. And so when that happens, you still own the patent until some, unless someone else, it's called reduces to practice. If somebody else can take that genius idea and then make it where you couldn't, they get the patent. Uh, and, and, and because they can make it, they can make it work. You drew it up and you invented it, but it didn't work. And, and so a lot of times you don't advertise that. You don't let people know, we had found this patent that they, and we went to them to buy it. And they go, well, yeah, we, you can do that, but we don't, we don't know how to make it. And so we wanted to make it. And so our engineers sat down and figured out how to make it. And, and so it became our patent without having to buy it, just because we reduced it to patent to practice first. So then I filed for European patent protection uh, under that, it was just U.S. patent protection. I filed for European patent protection and uh, was at a meeting in uh, Italy somewhere, uh, Milan, and uh, I was interviewed by the Wall Street Journal about that patents and word had gotten out that we had this technology that was interesting, hadn't been done before, and they wanted to know more about it, and I talked to them about it. And me talking to the press about that, an innocent conversation uh, from my company to Wall Street Journal. Uh, they published it and that erased our opportunity to get that patent in Europe. That cost our companies an unknown.
but millions of dollars, several million, not zillions, but several million dollars. We were never able to, to market that in Europe because we didn't have intellectual property because I had communicated to the wrong people at the wrong time because I was operating under US law. I'm an ignorant non-lawyer idiot. And uh, disclosure, public disclosure in Europe undermined your uniqueness. Even though the patent had been issued in the US, no one had talked about it. It had never been published in Europe. And one of our competitors, who is Dornier, it's part of Mercedes Daimler uh, Benz, uh, it's Deutsche Aerospace, the, the aircraft company in Germany. They wanted that technology too. And when they saw I disclosed it, uh, they go, oh, cool. <laughs> uh, we own it too now. And, and so that was a communication problem that wasn't funny to the shareholders of my company. It wasn't funny at all. That was a you could lose your job kind of thing. Um, uh, you know, my, my attorney uh, said they can uh, fire you, uh, but they can't fire you for being stupid. If you claim you just were stupid, <laughs> that's not a fireable offense. I don't know if he was right or not, or not but <laughs> made me feel a tiny bit better just being an idiot. Uh, but communication <laughs> is something that we want to talk about and we have a strategy with our team. And if you don't know what should be communicated and how and how much, find somebody that you can counsel and get counsel from that's been there that can give you information. A lot of times that's free. You just got to ask questions to the right people. Um, most corporations have corporate attorneys that work with you or for you all the time. Uh, they're a great source of, of what can and what can't and what should and what shouldn't be done. And usually that's either cheap or inside conversation free. And, and so uh, what we want to do is, is have this conversation because on the need to know basis, what we, that shows a court and in, if there's litigation, if there's arguments over progress or what you did or what you delivered and somebody winds up suing your project, then uh, if you have restricted information on a need to know basis, you show, demonstrate to the court that you are prudently protecting uh, what should be confidential and proprietary. If they show that you weren't, then they show that wanton negligence on your part, and therefore a whole bunch of the other things that they're charging you for doing, they will, you, you will lose, they will win, uh, because you've been negligent in one area, and that demonstrates broad negligence. If you're negligent in that, you're probably negligent in everything else too. You're just a sloppy operator, and therefore uh, you deserve to go down in flames. And so we don't want to put ourselves in that position, obviously, at all, uh, ever. So some of the things that, that we want to manage from an information point of view, call them uh, distribution triggers. So we don't, because what happens in a project, we get, we get involved and consumed with the day-to-day -day of the project and all the deadlines and progress and solving the problems. And that all lands on our desk if you're the project manager. You've got to keep all the balls in the air and keep it juggled and so forth. We forget some of the things about telling the rest of the people what they need to know about the status of the project. And so we need to set up some triggers. Uh, one example of a trigger would be at the end of every week, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're, we are going to routinely put an out an update on where the project is at. You put it on your calendar, your phone buzzes, and you go, oh yeah, I gotta, I gotta send out an update on the project. And you don't need an update on a project because you're in it up to here. You know exactly what's going on. And you forget the fact that others don't. So, so disseminating to the people that should be uh, communicated to uh, by a time-based uh, report uh, is, is uh, very appropriate. Communicating by event-based uh, milestones is another way to trigger communication. And you would decide that up front on your plan when you flow chart your project and the things, and you may build your Gantt chart, you know how to do that now. One of the items at the end of a Gantt chart row would be a trigger milestone that, bloop, we have a little celebration, we have a meeting, we have a communication, we have something that kind of updates people about this, this thing that has been finished. And in construction, they, they have a party when the last steel girder is laid in the building. You know, they, 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 they have different words for that, and they have Christmas tree they hang up there and flag and different things on the crane when they, they lift that last beam into place and they have a little party. The building's not done. The building's a long way from done. 
but it's a milestone that says the last of the steel has been bolted together or welded together or whatever. And so now the bones are there for this project. And that's a big deal. And, and that gives everybody confidence, well, they are going to finish this thing. We're making pro it's you know sometimes difficult to see the progress that's being made on your project. Uh, a lot of projects are done behind the curtain, so we need to announce that the milestone's been met and let the, the boss or the shareholders and the stakeholders know that we have, even though we're not done, we've met another milestone. And so communicating those milestones does a lot for morale uh, and it does a lot for confidence in your management skill. We can do those communications formally. So we develop a template of what this Friday report looks like, this update, or we have a form, it's a press release. If it's a big public project, that's what you'll do. You'll have press releases that will be scheduled to go out on a frequency basis before the fact. That's part of your map of the project, part of the planning, uh, that, what you're gonna, that you are going to communicate, not what you're going to communicate, but how and when it's going to be done. Uh, you can communicate in a project, just like in a company, there's all kinds of different ways you can have private meetings in the men's room. Uh, there's a lot of business conducted in the, on the golf course or, or, or at, at lunch or at dinner or in the hallway or, or in the conference room. We can, we, can, we can have formal meetings, we can have informal meetings. But you want to control them so that it's not, and it may look haphazard, it may look accidental, but it's an important way you are communicating. And you'll learn the personalities of the people you work with, what the best way is. Uh, some people, uh, if I schedule a meeting at, at, at 9 o'clock, they will never see me at 9 o'clock. Uh, I'll show up, and, and they might make me wait an hour and then not see me, right? And, and if that's, you work for a guy like that, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's not a good place to work. They're wasting money. And you're wasting time, and, and uh, it's frustrating to be in those situations. So with that person, I, I'm going to get most of the meetings done informally. I'm going to wait till they need to go to the bathroom. I'm going to follow them down the hall, talk about a few things, follow them in the men's room, wash my hands, talk, keep talking. And, and if they are intrigued enough at that point to have a meeting, they'll sit me down in their office and hear the rest of the story. If not, they've heard enough of the critical stuff that needed communicating. And it's done, and that, that's a pretty tacky way to do it, by the way. But if it, 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 there's some people, that's the best way to do it. It works. It, or you know when they're going to go out to the parking lot in the car. Follow them to the parking lot. Follow them, walk them out. And, and a lot of times, the critical information that we need to communicate isn't a big, long 45-minute meeting. It's three sentences and a yes or no. And, 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 we've, done our, done what we, and we've done what we needed and we've gotten the answers we needed in those cases. So kind of get to know whether we have um, those kinds of ad hoc meetings, I'll call them. Uh, find out if you need to meet in person at all. Lots of information is disseminated now via text and email. Uh, text is tougher because it's a little bit more tricky to extract a legal court record of your communications. Uh, it's doable, and, but, uh, uh, but it's it's a little trickier to do. Email uh, trails are stored everywhere, and it's real easy to, to, to track an email. You never told me that. Yes, I did. Here's the email. You know, uh, going back through your text and doing it takes a little more time. Uh, it, it is capturable, uh, but it but it uh, is a little more difficult. So whether you have uh, meetings, uh, right now we are in the best time ever in my history of life of having Zoom meetings. We we. Have, We've conditioned ourselves with the pandemic that it's okay to have a quick uh, meeting. And Zoom has thankfully limited free meetings to 45 minutes, but you can't even schedule one more than 35, I think. And uh, so that has, has moved a lot of one hour meetings down to half hour meetings, because you don't want Zoom to click off uh, before you've covered the important pieces of information that you needed in that meeting. And you don't want to pay money to have a one hour meeting. So, you know, uh, that, that, that has disciplined a lot of companies to have better meetings. And so um, the idea of, 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 uh, uh, of a, a email uh, group that, uh, or a group text for our communications is that we're able to, to control information 
Uh, in texting, it forces us to say, use shorter sentences and uh, bullet points as opposed to long, uh, like if I start talking, it becomes a long sentence. Uh, if I start writing, it gets to be a short sentence. And, and so that's, there's a value in that sometimes. Uh, the content that we are transmitting, sometimes we need to keep reminding certain targets that we communicate with of broad stroke stuff, high level, big picture, still on track, time-wise, but we're 100,000 over. Uh, material costs went up, um, and we're trying to capture back some of those with some labor efficiencies, keep you posted now coming on that. Did, that's a high-level stuff, no detail in it at all. On the detail side of the thing, we might say, we brought in four people uh, to do this, three of the four don't know what they're doing, and we've got a problem with training, we got a problem with them doing it, having to do stuff over, that's slowing us down, that's costing us more, and so that's a detail about how you're going to fix that that some audiences would need to hear. Other audiences, you don't ever want them to even know about that. You know, it's, they don't need to know about that. It's, you're solving it. You will get it solved. You'll go to them if you can't solve it. And, and so uh, picking and choosing what level of detail is needed to communicate to who, I guess what I'm bringing this up for is to say it's OK. You don't have to communicate the same thing to everybody. You can. You can pick and choose how much and to what detail we communicate with who. When we update them on how we're doing, remember it's always we're updating on all four things. Are we still inside scope or has it creeped out of that? Um, it, it, we, we had to do another thing. They wanted a pool. Well, to a builder, that just changed the scope of the project, right? Big time. Because now you got to put a pool in there. And you got to think about how to get around that and what all else you got to do. Uh, and, and it goes from a VRBO where we're going to rent a bedroom to now you're going to rent the whole dang house. And it's that scope creep. And so it becomes a much big, bigger project uh, to prepare the business for that one uh, than, than the first one. So in, or where are we at on scope? Uh, how's the quality uh, of what, we're, what the project is achieving, whether we're, we're writing procedures or we're uh, developing uh, processes or, or inventing a new product, whatever it might be, how's the quality impact uh, going on? Are we having to to do more or do less than we had hoped. Uh, where's our time frame, where's our cost? Those are the four things that we always want to be reporting on. And we need to have key, key performance indicators as often as we can when we are managing a project. Why is that? Tell us how good we're doing, keep us on track. Tell us how good we're doing, keeps us on track. And people believe the numbers for some reason. When I say, we're having a lot of problems and we're way behind, they don't know what that means. You know, what I think way behind, they may think, ah, it's no big deal. Or what I think is no big deal, they may think is way behind. And so don't use a qualitative descriptor, use a quantitative. We were gonna spend three, we spent four. That's a number. And now they decide whether that's a, that's a, a number that's a, a a deal breaker or whether it's not that big of a deal. Uh, all of the KPIs should connect back to those four uh, performance uh, criteria and uh, at why we want to keep track of numbers as we go and that's what we're going to do in our whole exercise today is we want to keep track of numbers not just in the beginning at the end but we want to keep track of numbers in the middle kind of where are we trending, where we're at. So we know about problems before uh, it's all of a sudden too late to fix it. If we're running out of, of time on one thing and it's projecting out, we need to know about that as quick as we can. And, and uh, uh, sometimes those projects don't have good checkpoints to update where they're at. I was working with a company uh, this morning um, that has a return of 1,100,000 pieces of a product to be reworked. Uh, kind of a little bit of a disaster. Uh, the rework becomes a project. That's not what the company does. They, they don't do rework uh, normally. They contractually agreed on this to do it. And, and what they came to me about was they were about halfway through redoing that and they found out that they're going to be out of materials to do the rework before they get to the end. And it's close enough now, that's a problem. To 
a big problem. Had they been tracking earlier key performance indicators, this was clear. It wasn't a surprise. It shouldn't have been a surprise. Uh, so coming to, you know, you call an outside consultant after it's too late, that's not the time to do it. The time to do it is as we go, checking on the trends and the numbers and what they're telling us, projecting it to the end, are we still going to be okay at the end? And if they'd have done those simple calculations, they would have known they weren't going to be okay. And there was a time earlier when they could have fixed this for no cost. Now they fixed it for my cost, and then there are recovery costs at this point to get back on track. And, and I don't know ultimately what it will wind up costing them, but it shouldn't have happened. And, and that's something that you don't want to be the driver when that happens. You know, you, you, you want to let, learn that lesson on somebody else's nickel. Um, one of the things that, that we need to do is uh, resolve issues as they come up as well. And communications plays a huge role in that, just like it does at home. You know, if your wife finds out after 30 years that you don't like scrambled eggs and she's been making them all that time, lucky you that she's been making stuff for you. Uh, but, uh, but it's a communication problem that, that it wasn't communicated that you really don't like scrambled eggs, you know? And, and, and uh, uh, so when, when those issues come up, uh, we need to have communication in order to, uh, to, to uh, help address and and fix the oh, and fix the uh, uh, the issues. The last line on there they call uh, active engagement. I call it active anticipation. And what that is is saying, all right, if I were them, what would I be asking? If I were them, what would I be uh, uh, diving in and digging deeper? And and because. Uh, we have people on our teams from a management perspective especially. They, they need to get involved and ask questions and poke at you a little bit because they're the boss and they don't know how to be the boss so they think the boss needs to do that and so they don't know exactly how to do that and, and so it, that's just sometimes, I'm not all the time. But if you've got a boss like that or a situation like that where it turns out that on this project you actually know a lot more than they do about it because you've been involved in it full time and they haven't. And so what but they're but they're gonna need to ask a question just because that proves and reinforces everybody they're the boss. They want to look smart, feel smart. And so uh, uh, active anticipation as I, I call it is I often will try at least have a discussion, can we set this person up to ask the right question that I got all the answers for already. So lead them to something. It's like when you're going to get audited by the IRS, I would advise you to put an error in there on purpose that's the red herring that they will catch you on and write you up on. At that point in time, the pressure's off. That doesn't mean that they won't give you a lighter audit, but it, it means they'll give you a lighter audit. They'll think they've got something. They have to find something. Auditors have to find something. Bosses have to contribute something. That's in our mindset. That's in our DNA, our psyche. If, if you're a boss, you have to contribute something. So help them contribute. Lay something in there that, that will be an obvious question that they're going to need to ask, and you entertain the question, you answer it, and now they, now they feel good that they've made a contribution, their thumbprint is on the project, and they didn't get in your way and screw anything up. Because that's a problem with bosses sometimes. They get in our way and screw things up. And they don't mean to, they just do. And, and so project management is managing the boss often as much as it's managing the project itself. We're managing up and we're managing down if those are proper terms. I, I don't like those terms. Uh, I think everything should be flipped. Very much true. I think the front line is the top of the organization and it's all standing on the owner. I think they're the bottom, but org charts are never drawn that way. Uh, they're always drawn the other way with the king up at top uh, or queen as it might be. All right, uh, let's see where we're at. It's We're close enough to take a break. We're gonna come back and we're going to do an exercise together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of us in the class today. Uh, I think we'll have you working in groups of three then on this. So you're kind of sitting in groups of three right now. Uh, if we go front to back, we go to view three, and you go to view three. Take a break, come back, and grab some pieces of paper uh, by Landon, if you would, 
uh, blank sheets of paper and have some because you're going to need to draw, uh, uh, you're going to need to label some stuff and do some easy math on 11 variables that we're going to look at. Take a break. We'll see you back in 10.
All right, we're back. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch a seven-minute video on uh, risk breakdown structure before we do our exercise together. Uh, there's a couple things that uh, are, are worth understanding here. Uh, this guy is called the risk doctor, and and uh, uh, he he makes his living uh, assisting uh, risk management from a project management perspective and from a legal perspective, uh, insurance and that kind of stuff. So it's a little bit broader. Uh, he has some um, expertise in, in a, a risk breakdown structure. We talked about a work breakdown structure, and we learned how to do that. We call it a WBS. A RBS is a risk breakdown structure. He's categorized 13 types or 13 categories of risk, and I think that's, that's worth us having kind of on the top of our head a little, a little bit uh, of what the categories of risks are are, and you might make the list, because as you evaluate risk on projects you're doing, not a bad idea to kind of scan through those types of risk to make sure you're not missing one, uh, or not forgetting something that could be uh, dangerous to your, uh, your project. And as I mentioned to you, risk management, uh, risk assessment is now something that's being uh, routinely uh, required in all ISO 9000 related companies. And so if you're, you're working with a company that, or a customer that's, that is uh, ISO uh, registered, then uh, that'll be a language they already are speaking and they will expect you to know something about risk management and have conversations about that. There are various types of risk management we talked about. Uh, Joel talked about you're doing a major ones with healthcare uh, and you know, how you manage the risk of your employee group. And, and uh, uh, this is, this is probably one of the more complicated things we'll do in our life. It's unbelievable how, uh, and, and it is, it's called risk because it's a guess. We don't know. Uh, we don't know. In healthcare, we don't know who's going to get sick. Uh, I don't know how much money it will take for me to live till I die. Well, I, I don't know when I'm going to die. I mean, I can control that. I can die now, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, just so you all know. Uh, but, but otherwise, we don't, we don't, the, the, we don't know the unknown, and so managing the project of, of your retirement is one of the more important projects you will manage, and, and you'll do it well or you do it badly, and depending on which one you do, uh, will determine a little bit the ease of your life, you know? And, and uh, uh, so when we're talking about project management, your personal career is a project, your personal uh, 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 life is a project, family, and so forth, and your retirement is a project. So these risks to our retirement are more important to me than the risks to my boss's company, uh, just uh, as we evaluate and we think about risk. So seven minute video, not very long. Good morning, David. Good morning, Karat. My question today to you is, uh, what are the various categories of risk? Yes, we generally think of risk as a whole thing, so we're doing risk management, all risks, and we're doing risk identification, all of the risks, and we're assessing all the risks. But risks come in different flavors or different types, and so it's important for us to have a broad view of risk to make sure that we don't miss any important categories. So risk categories or risk types are defined or listed as a kind of prompt, as a reminder to say, well, don't forget there's financial risk and there's reputation risk and there's environmental risk and there's safety risk and there's strategic risk and there's project and operational risk. Now, that's a very long list. How do you remember all of those things? Well, you could write them down and just make a list on a piece of paper or on a tablet uh, or put it on the wall and then just go down the list. That's okay. I think there's a better way to do it, which is to organize our risk categories in a way that makes sense. So you'll notice in answers to other questions, what we've been trying to do is to go behind the jargon and look at the underlying logic or the underlying framework. And if we understand that, then the detail becomes clear. So the same is true with risk categories. I like to think in hierarchical terms or layers or levels. So we could say at the very highest level, there's just risks. Yeah. But we could then think about how we might divide that into types of risks. Yes. What we're looking for is where the risk comes from. And I think there are four major types of risk. 
you might think differently, maybe you think there's three or five, but to think about major sources of risk. So my four would be this, there are technical risks, and depending on what type of industry or sector or project or implementation you're talking about, the technical risks will be different. If you're building a bridge, or if you're developing a new drug, or if you're moving an office complex from one side of the city to the other, the technical risks will be different. But as a general heading, there are technical risks. And most things that we do have technical risks of some sort. Mm -hmm. Then we have commercial risks for most organisations. There are some charities and, and uh, not-for-profit and, and government and so on that don't have that kind of commercial exposure. But generally, commercial is a, is a category of risk, a big category. And underneath there's lots of detail. But as a big headline item, you've got technical risks and commercial risks. Then we normally have management risks. Risks that are internal to the organisation in the way that we structure ourselves, the way that we make decisions, that we prioritise, that we communicate, that we resource. All of the, the things to do with our organisation itself, there are ways in which we manage which give rise to internal risks. And then if those are the internal risks that come from management, another big category are external risks. Things that are outside of our control, like the weather, like competition in the marketplace, um, like uh, regulatory authorities, like the law or politics. These are external to our organisation and they bring risks. That's right. So we might say in terms of categories, from the top there's just the world of risks, general. But there are four big headings which apply in all situations. Technical risks, commercial, management, management and external. external. So that would be our level one. Then below that we could break out another level. So we could say, under technical, let's imagine we're doing some software development. We might talk about technology, about interfaces, about processes, about testing. Uh, these are all technical types of risk under the heading of technical. Uh, under commercial, we might have uh, subcontracts. We might have our own client contracts, terms and conditions, legal liabilities, warranties. These are commercial types of exposure. Under management, we might have policies and procedures, strategy. We might have resourcing, communication, uh, reputation. These are all things to do with the management, which could give rise to risks. And then under external, we've mentioned the weather and the competition and the marketplace and legal frameworks, regulatory frameworks, lobby groups and so on. So what you do is, once you've got the big heading, you go below that to the detail. Now we have a structured way of thinking when we come to identify the risks and to assess them and to group them and to learn lessons about risk, we've got a framework which says not just, well, there's 20 different categories to remember. There are four headline categories, technical, commercial, management, management and external. external. You could remember those. And then that gives you a focus. And then under each of those, you could say, well, technical, I know what that is. Yes. That's processes yes. and technology and interfaces and so on. And then when we come to identify risks, we can go through the categories yes. and use those different headings as a yes. prompt. So the categories are, um, are defined in layers. Yes. Now what we can do once we have that, and, and that has a name. So all of these things have jargon names. It's a breakdown structure or a hierarchy. So we call it a risk breakdown structure, an RBS. And that's the te technical name for this kind of a hierarchy of sources of risk. And it's something which I developed actually in the year 2002, I think. It's become quite a standard uh, tool within the risk uh, sector. Um, so what we can do then is when we're identifying risks, we can use these different level two headings as a prompt. Yep. We can then record risks in yep. each of those headings as a checklist. Yes. We can look for concentrations of risk once we've identified them to see if there are particular areas of focus. So maybe there's lots of interface risk mm -hmm or lots of political risk, or lots of uh, subcontractor risk by, by mapping the risks into the risk breakdown structure. We can see if we've missed something. Do you know we never thought about anything commercial? Why is that? Because there's no one from the commercial department in our management team. So maybe we've missed a whole set of risks. So having a structured view of risk categories helps us to make sure we don't miss anything, to learn from the future, and to make sure that our risk identification covers the whole breadth of risks. Thank you very much, David. And that, in, indeed, I'm going to remember that term, RBS. Please do. Thank you very much.
So the idea there, there, there are... Montero Calm makes Gan. I got out of here though. Um, there are overlaps in the third level that he talked about there, and so you know you can make a list of 13, or it could be 20, whatever it is. That's not the point. The idea is that we have the this thought process for our project, which may not be the thought process that may not be the same for another project, but it's identifying the risk. When we do this and we set up templates and it's electronically done, like in the medical device or pharmaceutical arenas uh, or aerospace arenas, uh, those risk uh, uh, impacts, you, you did the, on the Liz Taylor wedding, you did an impact analysis of how likely, how severe would it be if it happened, uh, and, and, and you came up with a multiplier of variables, and then you came up with numbers that you could rank. Well, that's exactly how it's done in the real world. I had lunch yesterday with, uh, with a, a guy that just had gotten back from an aerospace conference in uh, Germany, and they were looking at a uh, supplier to um, uh, Aeroflot, which is the Russian uh, aerospace program and, and airlines these days, and the material sourcing requirements for uh, parts for Russia was exactly the same as parts for Airbus, which was exactly the same as it is for parts for Boeing. All of them use templates that have those multipliers on them. And if the risk hits a certain point, Boeing assigns a dollar value to it. If it hits a certain amount of dollar impact, then it goes red in the templates. And you have to then uh, have a mitigation plan in writing for all of the numbers that come up in red. So, so you know, our businesses aren't quite that sophisticated yet but that's, we have companies that are using that risk breakdown structure here in St. George. It's not, uh, if your company isn't, uh, it could, and you would benefit from, them, uh, from it if it did because you would be uh, solving problems before they cost you money. And that's really what you want to do is identify the stuff that could bite you. And, and you don't want to become a pessimist. Uh, you don't want to become a you know, Debbie Downer and you know, everything. Uh, but you do need to do a negative analysis on everything. What is the possibility that's going wrong? Because the marketing team's never going to do that. <laughs> and the sales team's never going to do that. They're going to go full bore about how great this is and how awesome it is. And somebody's got to do uh, what we call the black hat thinking that is the grounded, realistic rationale of what could go wrong. And, and are we prepared for that? Or could we manage that? Could we handle that? Our projects, we have to do that. All right. Uh, moving back to this, we have, we have uh, done some things on this slide presentation uh, before. Uh, we stopped at uh, an earlier slide. I'm not sure exactly where we stopped, but let me, let me start this again because somewhere they lost our graphics. PowerPoint lost our graphics. So I will put those back in. Well, they didn't lose a the graphic, they lost the whole hard drive. There it sort of is. There. That says that we probably got a cable problem, right? Now we've got it with graphics, and we were looking at uh, controlling our costs. And I want to start here looking at our inputs to cost control. We should have a plan. That plan should be defining uh, the, the, the costs that we expect. We should have a investment uh, uh, working capital structure of some sort from which we know uh, what is available resource-wise. We need information about 
how much our burn rate is. We call that work performance information. What are we burning you know, every day to turn the lights on? There's fixed costs that have to get paid, and then there's variable costs uh, that we have to have. Uh, and then what is it that we have available in terms of resources uh, that we, we need to either rent, borrow, or we already own? And, and, and those are the things that going into our cost. And sometimes companies by default buy equipment when they can rent it from AIR. You know, you don't need a traco because you're not using it all the time every day. Uh, you need to dig a trench. So don't buy a $180,000 traco uh, to dig a trench. Go rent one, you know, and, and, and managing costs that way. Uh, the tools and techniques, one of the tools that you have been introduced to is the earned value management technique. We are going to do that again today, but, but uh, it's just to, to complete the list of stuff that we have, forecasting is a tool that companies all use. And if you haven't participated in forecasting process, uh, lucky you, at some point in time you'll have to. Uh, the company uses it for forecasting sales. What are our sales going to be next year? You know, we get more customers, less customers, are we losing business, are we gaining business? Cost, you know, what, what are the top line going to be? We don't know, we have to guess. If you're a public company, you have to tell the public market what you think your sales are going to be. And from that, you have to tell them what you think your earnings are going to be next quarter. And if your earnings fall short of what you thought they'd be, they think you're an idiot manager and people will sell off your stock and your stock price will go down. And that happens, we see it all the time. When projections aren't met, forecasts aren't met, uh, the price, the value of the company goes up or down. It goes down when it's not met. Uh, it goes up when they under, when they get a surprise. It goes up more than they thought. And they don't know necessarily why, but they think that they ride the wave when they do that. So forecasting in our projects is important. And the two ways of forecasting, we'll talk about this more next module, but there's top down and bottom up forecasting. And, and the way you do it in a simple way a let's say we have we let's say we're a small company and we have four salesmen that are out in the field selling stuff and we we in last year we did we did four million dollars worth of business and essentially we had some house accounts but essentially each salesman did give or take a million dollars worth of sales we had a top performer and a bottom performer but they averaged out to a million apiece so a top-down forecast would be saying okay uh, inflation's gone up, our prices should go up effect, uh, in sync with that, and we wouldn't gain any space. But overall, we've been able to increase prices a little bit, 3 4%, 5%. Let's say we increase prices 10% this year. We support it with a little technology improvement. Uh, but we rate it, So if we have the same business we had last year, our business is now going to be one, a 4.4 million, right? because you had 10% sales, uh, price increase, you're now at 4.4 million instead of 4 million. So that's a top down, where you just take the big chunks and say a percentage increase or de decrease, we're losing this, we're gaining this, and you're adding, we're adding, we're, we're, we're uh, 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 chicken place and we're adding so many joints, you know, and, and, and that's gonna add to, yeah, that's a top down. Bottom up uh, forecast is where we go to each salesman and we say last year we did 1 million uh, next year we want you to do 1.2 million how would you do that and they then say okay well this account this account I'll go land these guys but I don't know for sure I'll land them so I'll, I'll put two in there I'll try to land one of the two and if I do then my numbers will go up that's a bottom up and then we add all those increases that the salesman on the front row think they can achieve and we add that all up that's a bottom up forecast those two numbers may not be the same they may come up to a bigger number or a smaller, depending on, on how they are. Now, we, we learn personality then. On forecasting, some people do what we call sandbag. That means they under-report what they think they can achieve because they want to hit, they want to do it. So they keep some stuff in their pocket so that you know when push comes to shove, they got a surprise bonus they can throw in there. And okay, I made my numbers because I, I held back a little bit, and now fortunately I made my numbers. So that's a personality type. And then there's the, the, uh, oh, the optimist. Oh, yeah, I can land that, and I can land that, I can do that, I can do that. And they believe in themselves so much that they think they're going to do it, and they fully intend to go do it, but they overestimate what they can achieve. They tell you they're going to work 12-hour days, but you look back and go, they're really not. Uh, 
you know, they want me to think they are, but they're really not. And, and that's okay, I'm not paying them for 12 hours, I'm paying them salary, so I'm only paying them for eight, but they're making me believe they're working more, and so they forecast based on that, and in reality, they, they have to deliver that. So we, we learn how to discount optimistic forecasts and how to pump up a little bit uh, uh, pessimistic forecast, forecasts. But that's a tool we put into cost management because if we get either one of those wrong, we miss, right? And we don't want to miss because I want my reputation to be, I brought it in at, on budget. I, I was able to get the team to get what we thought we were going to get. And so variance analysis is another tool we use where uh, we are looking at how are we compared to what we thought. Where's the variance at? We're spending this much more, this much less, this much ahead of time, this much behind time. Uh, and that's the same thing as, uh, similar thing to number three, the two complete performance index. What, what's left? What, are, what is remaining that we have to finish in order to get this project done? And whether it's lines of software code that need to be written, or whether it's uh, concrete that needs to be poured, or, 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 or engineering work that needs to be done. Uh, and, and so we have project management software that can help do us help all of that stuff. At the end of the, the day, what we have is adjustments to our, our, our budget and forecast, uh, where we think we are based on uh, where we've come, we're halfway into the project, and we have those updates. We will have uh, to filter in change requests uh, that they, you know, we got into it, and we saw we had more room than we thought. We want to put in, um, you know, we just did here at the college, right? Or I don't know where I'm at. Over there, on that side of the building, uh, we just added, we took out a fence and we added two more rows of parking. You should have seen that on day one, but that's a change, right? That's a change. The building didn't get any bigger. It's the same size building it was, and we didn't buy more chairs. Uh, we just needed more parking spots. And so maybe we'll fill in more chairs. Maybe that's, that's why we need more. Maybe we just missed it in the first place. Uh, we saved money and so underestimated, we put it in a change order. If that's all part of one budget, that's a problem because we didn't, we didn't calculate that much space for parking. And so now we need to go back and do that. So that's an output that would be, we would be updating. So with that, uh, how do we control costs? Because this is, at the end of the day, what we really have to do to look good. So we're going to follow our cost management plan. We are going to uh, constantly look for where else can we draw resources that will help us hit the ball out of the park? And, and that doesn't mean we're looking for free, we're just looking to optimize the resources that we have. If I find that I've got people that are out in the field installing stuff and they come back to the shop an hour early every day uh, and they kind of go home because we can't put them out on another job, could I use them on something else for one hour? Maybe. Uh, and so maybe let's do that, you know? And so we optimize resources that were kind of free to us that, that can help us get our projects done uh, a little bit more effectively. Uh, managing change, I've talked about that in an early class, we often don't do that very well. I'm gonna come back with a little more comment on the progress report uh, and, and how, we, uh, how we do our, uh, our uh, uh, mapping of progress. Right now I want us to focus on the earned value management, which is what we did on day one of the class, or the first exercise we did. Remember we did that. Uh, so I want to review that a little bit. Earned value man management is a method to measure project performance against our targets, the scope, the schedule, the money, and the uh, time frame. Well, the schedule time frame is pretty much the same. Uh, so we're looking at where are we versus where we thought we would be, and we interpret that uh, and we interpret a few uh, things we need to calculate with math. And I remember from the first day of meeting some of you, you, you articulated a preference that you didn't want to have to do a lot of math. And I think that, uh, that uh, uh, yeah, I've forgotten a lot of math. And, and, and I'm, I'm dangerous if I go to do math in my head uh, anymore because I, I get it wrong uh, pretty easily. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm holding to the promise that we don't need to do a lot of math, but there's a couple of math things that we need to do. And, and I want us to walk into these a little bit uh, together in our teams of three in a minute or two, but let's review a couple of things first. Uh, we have some, some uh, uh, 
indexes that we can calculate, a cost performance index and a schedule performance index. If we're able to quantitatively analyze that, <coughs> excuse me, we then will know, are we in the blue zone or the red zone? Where are we at here? Are we in trouble or are we ahead of schedule? And by doing some simple math, we can keep track of that. And we're gonna do that math together uh, in, in a few minutes. I want to go through <coughs> each one of these terms. I think we got two pages of terms. We, I don't know. I'm pretty sure we have two pages of terms. And I don't know if maybe our PowerPoint got screwy again, in which case I'll have to, I'll have to work on that. Something's not right with PowerPoint here. Mm. It's not doing that. It's not doing what it ought to do. But let's start with this page anyway. Um, we're going to go around the room with read the definition and we'll talk about it for just a second. The first one is abbreviated EV. You've got a sheet of blank paper in front of you. Write that one down, you're going to need it in there. It should be great. So, PowerPoint. <laughs> Which I think I can. Uh, so, I'll give you a second to make sure you get, your, you get a paper. Uh, EV stands for earned value. So, when you see EV in a formula, you will remember we're looking for earned value. As of right now, What's the estimated value of the work that's actually done? And we call that earned value. That means that it's, you know, if you were, if you were clocked in and somebody agreed to pay you 100 bucks a day, based on the time it is right now, what's your earned value? If it's lunchtime and you've worked half a day, you've earned 50 bucks. You won't earn the other 50 bucks until you work it, until you clock out. But right now, you you know, so far, your earned value is where you are at relevant to your day's pay and where we are in the day. That's pretty easy to understand from a pay point of view. It's no different for a project. So we can learn that and memorize that the same way. Uh, let's go around the room on this. Josie, the second variable we want to learn. Actual cost. Yep. AC, actual cost. What is the actual cost definition? As of today, what is the actual cost compared to the life work accomplished? Okay. What that means is what do we really pay for? Not have, what do we budgeted, what do we allowed, what do we intend to pay, what do we spend? And this is when when some of you that are that are schooled in accounting, and we'll talk more about this in another class, in another course, um, there's two kinds of of accounting. Uh, there's a cash method and an accrual method. And in project management, we, we use both a tiny bit, but in this variable, uh, Josie is pointing out the cash basis. So this is what have we actually spent to this moment in time. You need a blank piece of paper, Brad. And on that blank piece of paper, we've only got two variables written so far, so you can catch up real easy. We've got EV and AC, earned value and actual cost. Mitch, the third variable. Plan value rather than any way to estimate value of work plan. Yeah. All right, so this is the plan value is looking to the end of the day, right? This is looking, what was my, my planned value for my wage uh, this week? You know, what am I expecting? What am I projecting? What am I thinking? And so plan value is abbreviated PV. On the slide that was before this, back when the slides were working, uh, we had the next variable. Andrew, it is? Cost variance. Uh-huh. And what is the cost variance that you see there? 
Cost variance is earned value minus actual cost. Okay, so you need some math, right? But this one's subtracting math, we can do that. Uh, it, it, the, the harder part isn't the math, it's just to remember what the variables to hit for, right? So uh, cost variance, what is the definition of cost variance? Negative is over budget, positive is under budget. Okay, on a cost variance, I don't want to be in the hole. That means I've overspent what I thought I should have spent. All right, so cost variance is negative is problem. Uh, cost variance is positive is at the moment good news. That doesn't mean that, you know, you know we, we, maybe there's one thing that costs the most, but it's the very last of the project. And so, you know, just because we're on track right now and maybe ahead a little bit, uh, doesn't mean that we don't have a big expense coming up. So, so don't fool ourselves with the timeline. The timelines uh, and the cost lines on projects are never linear. What that means is they're never on a, a, you know, we don't spend the same every day. And we don't put in the same effort every day. We don't get the same yield every day. We don't have the same cost every day. And sometimes they are logarithmic, which means they ramp up exponentially fast. And, and when that happens, um, we've got to be holding on to the reins tight uh, or else we'll get a surprise. So that's the fourth variable. The fifth variable, Joel? Uh, it's a schedule variance. Uh-huh. Okay. Negative is behind schedule, positive is ahead of schedule. Okay, what, how do we calculate the schedule variance? EV minus PV. Okay, you're going to write that EV minus PV. EV is the? Earned value, PV is the plan value. Okay, so so far the math is easy. Just remember more than what the formula stands for. That's the tricky part. All right, uh, well, uh, Eli pick, will pick you up for the sixth one. Cost performance index? Yep, cost C performance index. CPI equals EV divided by AC. So All right. earned value divided by actual cost. Right, so a cost performance index looks at the variable earned value, which is the very first one we've looked at, divided by our actual. All right, when we do that, we're gonna get a number and define what that number is. We are getting blank worth of work out of every $1 spent. Are funds being used efficiently? So are we getting, you know, this could be a positive or negative two, right? Or I mean, a, pl a, b a bigger than one or a l less than one number, and, and so, uh, this will give us an index, uh, uh, an idea if our index, if we're in good shape or we're bad shape. Landon, read the last one. Schedule performance index. SPI equals EV divided by PV. You want me to read that? Yep. Okay. We are only progressively at a blank percentage of the rate originally planned. Okay. Originally planned. I guess I misspelled that. Uh, uh, plan is correct. Thanks for reading it right. <laughs> uh, and so, so if you've written those down, we have a few more, and I'm hoping really, really much that I think I might have a bad cable here. Is my, what the problem is that the, the PowerPoint is getting disconnected from my drive. So let me mess with this for just a second and see if I can find find slide 15 here because I'm not seeing. here. There it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to file, save this on the desktop so I don't have to worry about my, my cable. I apologize for the hiccup. Alright. Theoretically, we be closer on. All right, we have a few more terms to define. I was sure there was a second page uh, to that. Uh, Jake, the next one. Budget at completion. <clears throat> How much do you budget for this total project? Okay, so this is this comes from our initial plan, right? Where we kind of looked what the project was going to going to entail. Uh, what our this is what our our starting budget was. When we get it done, this is what it's going to be. Um, 
but now we, we th this one doesn't take a math thing, but we're going to use that as a variable for math questions. Eric, read the second one. Estimate and completion. BAC divided by CPI. What do we currently expect the whole project cost of forecast? Okay, so we could back up to the, the cost performance index, at, which is a rate of how we're doing so far. And guess what? It didn't want to go back forward, so let's not do it that way. Let's do it another way. All right. Um, we'll do it like this. It won't be the whole thing, but you can still read it. Uh, uh, Joshua, the next variable. Are we estimate to completion? Yeah, estimate at completion. Did we just read, you just read that, Eric. I, hello. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Uh, do the estimate to completion like you initially wanted to do. I misdirected you. Bad uh, project this management. Point on, how much more do we expect it, it to cost to finish the project under the forecast? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's better. That works better. I was listening, but I wasn't thinking. There's a problem when you do that. And the last one, we're back up to Josie. Surveying completion? Yes. Okay, so the uh, uh, estimate at completion is an important forecasting value. Uh, the uh, uh, hang on a second, what are we doing here? All right, so we can graphically represent this stuff. And, and I'm going to spend a minute on this uh, graph. I'm going to see if I can blow this up to the whole uh, slide size and then get back out of it without losing it. All right. Let's take a look at this uh, together. Got some fine print on here. It's pretty hard to read this bottom uh, back of the room. So what we have here is we have the earned value is the green line, the planned value is the, the blue line, the actual value is the red line. So if we map out our, our, our project plan early on, it will be the blue line. And then if we look at the actual uh, uh, work done or the plan, uh, we will see the blue line, the red line and the green line. Our EV is what? Earned value, our PV is what? Plan value. Plan value. The schedule variance is the difference between here and here at any moment in time, right? The AC is what? Actual cost. Actual cost. BAC, I don't need that yet. Um, okay, so I've got the schedule variance there. I have a cost variance at this moment in time of the difference between this green dot and the red dot. And that would be, at any moment in time, as time changes, I can map that and see where my variances were at. Now, <coughs> that reporting day is going to advance. Uh, these numbers now are going to be calculated differently. So what are the three that we've got on the left, those dotted lines? EAC is what? Estimate at completion. At earnings at earned at completion, is that right? Estimated at completion, okay? Because over here, this is on. That makes it hard to remember, right? Okay. <coughs> BAC is what? Budget at completion. At completion. And AC is what? After cost. We're going to talk about that. Okay. So in this bo these boxes, we have <coughs> the completion is the blue line from our plan. We plan to complete it here. You notice that the green projection ends here. Those two days aren't the same. It says we have a schedule move. The top box says projection of the schedule delay at completion. That's how far do we think the schedule is going to be off at completion. The estimate at completion 
is where the green line ends. That's our projection based on what we've got <laughs> into it right now. Because what we should have had into it is this much, but we actually have this much into it. We got a problem. We got to finish that up at some point. Then we have the projection of the cost variance at completion. That is how much money we've run, all, run away with. That's the difference between what we're projecting on the green line and what we planned on the blue line. <coughs> Excuse me. So after we go through the math, sometimes the best thing to hand out is the chart. You graph it up like this, and you can talk about it. You got some real numbers on there. The beauty of that is when I'm reporting bad news to you that says we are going to be that much over budget and we're going to this, this late on the project, you are firing dart, uh, darts at me. If you're the team, if you're the owner's group, if you're the customer, uh, and, and you still, I'm responsible, I'm the project manager. But if I put up a map, you're not going to argue with me as much the same, and you're going to, you're going to see it visualized, and you're going to be thinking, what, what can I do to make this green line stop sooner? You know, and, and, and that's constructive instead of thinking, what can I do to kill Steve? I'd rather you be looking at a graph and thinking about how do we move those lines around. That's physically something to do mentally. That's it's something that's worthwhile as opposed to uh, maybe focusing on taking me out. Uh, we can do the same thing in the Gantt chart. Uh, and and uh, uh, some of you have experience in doing that. Uh, EV is calculated by percent progress times the plan budget and mandates. Uh, you see it from that. We can graph it uh, that way as well. What I want to do is an exercise. It is 7.20. Uh, when we have finished this exercise, you can go home. And you might be able to do it before one hour, uh, and in which case, that's great. Uh, so we were in teams of three. Brad, you arrived. You're now a team of four over there. And you guys are three. You guys are three here. Uh, get together a little bit. Here's the project. Josie, read the first bullet point, please. We have a project to build a box. The box is six sided. Each side takes up, uh, it, it takes one day to build and close it in for $1,000 per side. The project plan to be completed one and after the other is the end of day three. All right, the second bullet, Mitch. <laughs> There's 11 of them, and they'll make you cross-eyed. You know, when you look at them, they all sound the same, look the same, but we already know, we know what they are, and we know what the definition is. Uh, we saw it. I did not add this out. This isn't a PowerPoint. This is a PowerPoint that is on Canvas. Uh, Andrew took a picture of the definitions. So you got a little cheat sheet. Uh, that, that, that you can refer to. That's a good thing. Um, the next bullet, Andrew. Uh, describe your interpretation based on the calculation. So we we see what there. Uh, uh, what it? Um, in the beginning, they were over budget, uh, but as it progresses to side four, which would be day four, they should be at about four thousand dollars. We got a problem. So what we want to do is we want to go back and do those calculations based on the exercise, and we want to put it in a chart like this. And we want to answer, is the project below or over budget? Andrew told you <laughs> some of the answers. Uh, but you need to project that to the ending. Because we see where we're at right now. How does that pan out as we play the project? The project is late or ahead of schedule. Uh, how much more money do we need? That kind of tips ahead that, <laughs> that we got a problem money-wise. All right, so you are going to take 
PV, EV, AC, BC, BAC, CV, CPI, I'll let Mitch read the rest of that list. Uh, and you are going to do the calculation for it and the result of it based on what you know, which here's the, here are the knowns. <coughs> this chart and these numbers. So the first thing I would do uh, as a team is go back to your notes. I ask you to take notes. You need to know what those, those uh, letter combinations stand for. We talked about every one of them. Uh, so with your team, go back. And if you need me to move back or forth on a slide while your team is talking, let me know. It's not, I'm not trying to trick anybody. All, I just want you to actually, each one of you on your blank sheet of paper, I want you to write down the calculation. Because I want you to know that how to get the answer here. This is not high performance math, but if you forget what the variable stands for, uh, you won't know how, how to give your team the answer. So get together with your group. Uh, the first thing I would do is, is write down the calculation for these indexes and so forth in, this, in, this, in the, uh, the little graph you're going to make. You know, like the first one, I'll start you out. It's planned value. So what is the planned value? You can go back to this chart, and you can see the budget of what the planned value is. So I want you to. Could you show us the last two again? Because I missed the definitions for the last two. Like, um, yeah. These? Yeah. Okay, I can. And I'll show you the slide before just for a second in case you didn't get one written down or you can't read the writing. We take better notes when we know we gotta use the formula. <laughs> yeah. So there's the slide well, before. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> This slide is this. Say that again. So when you're doing the value of the accomplished work, would you say the value for the side that cost a thousand two hundred is only one thousand because that's how much we expected to cost? Because the value is whatever they're willing to pay for it. Oh, right? we're given the value so here. Your budget is a thousand per side. Okay, so that's the value. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm mixing right. up definitions right. of value where it's like, what's so the markup on it? Because right. the value right. changes right. depending right. on how much we're selling.
I can't. Every, yeah, I bet I should. I <laughs> I'm good at that. I'm good at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But is the chart based on where we're at today? Okay. Well, I mean, you can ask that trial. Okay, so it's <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, we're in the
Don't have to graph it. Okay. Just come up with a number. There you go. How much more money do you need? $2,900.97. You got a different number? Still working. I mean, we can you got a number? Three eighty two. We're not going to need to talk more than the We can collaborate. No? No. Or is this going home early? Is that individual teams? Yeah, we are done over here. Done. It might be right, it might not be right. So BAC is 6,000, right? BAC, that completion is 6,000. And then AC is 3,450, right? AC is 3,450. PD? Yes. PD? Sorry, negative. Wait, how much? 3,000. 1,000. Plus the 1,000. I was reading it as 1,000 plus 1,000. Plus five hundred plus two fifty. No, no, that's that's where the. Let me show. Let me show you. Because it'd be five hundred dollars more for set four and two fifty more for set three. So let me let me show you again. Two hundred twenty-seven fifty. Because PV is going to be one thousand. So uh, the estimated value of work to be done. So we only have say that again. So P V being the planned value. Of where you're at now. So yeah, as of right now, what is the estimated value of work to be done? Correct? No, it's what you've got done. I got the A C plan. That's cost. I'm reading value and cost.
I'm going to go through another exercise real quick with you, just one slide. And let's look at this together, then we'll go through my answers for the project that we're working on. And maybe I'll apply it to us, but I don't want to really take the overtime here. So based on, these are, the, these are asking some of the same variables as the other projects that we were asking. So example, at the, you've got a project budget of $400,000. You've got a project schedule for four months. You are at the three month checkpoint and at three months, you have spent $200,000. You have completed $100,000 worth of work. It looks like you're in trouble. Uh, because you, at the end of the three month checkpoint, and it's a four month project, you should be three quarters done. Uh, you've spent some money, but you aren't three quarters done. So let's look at the numbers here. So our earned value is $100,000, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We're at the, at the end, end of, what it, as of today, what is the estimated value of the work actually accomplished? It says work completed 100,000. So that's what value is. Actual cost, as of today, what is the actual cost incurred for the work accomplished? It is you've spent $200,000, but you've only got $100,000 of the work done, right? Value. Okay, you've spent more, but you haven't completed that much. All right, as of today, the plan value, what is the estimated value of work planned to be done? The estimated value of the work planned to be done is there's $300,000 left. Is that correct? So cost variance is your, your EV divided uh, minus the AC. So 100 minus 200 is you're in the red, $100,000, uh, meaning you are over budget, that's what it means. All right, schedule variance is 100,000 minus 300,000, you are 200,000 schedule variance, you're in trouble. Yep. Uh, cost performance index is 100,000 divided by 200,000 is 50%, that means you're getting 50 cents worth of work out of every dollar you're spending, that's a problem. Um, funds aren't being used efficiently or something's going on and your scheduled performance index is your EV divided by the PV 100,000 divided by 300,000 that's one third so we're only progressing at one third percent of the rate originally planned so the revised total duration of the project that was supposed to be a four month project can be calculated baseline duration four divided by the scheduled performance index which is 0.33, so you are at 12 months right now. You're projecting that to then to become a 12 month project when in fact you originally planned it to be a four month project. Okay? So that's how you use those numbers. Let's go to the, as the example that you have been working on. Okay, this is the data you've been staring at and, and, and doing a good job, by the way. I've been listening to conversations and you can't tell I'm listening. I can hear what you're talking about, you're on track. Uh, so that's what your chart could look like. Plan value, earned value, actual cost. You know what those, those numbers stand, or those letters stand for. If we put numbers into it, I'll leave this one up for a while. Write this down and tell me if I'm wrong. I could be. Uh, if you see something different, I'll discuss it with you one week from today. Uh, we're not going to hold class later. So the plan value, we were tasked with uh, a plan value of uh, three, three days into the project. We're, today is the end of day three. We should be three days into the project or we should be uh, three sides ahead of us. Either way you look at it, it's a thousand plus a thousand plus a thousand, right? So our plan value is 3,000. Our earned value is we've done 100% of one side, we've done 100% of the second side, we've done 75% of the third side, we have done 50% of the fourth side, right? So add those all together. The math is wrong there. Yeah. It's 3,250. 3250. Really? Okay. 
Thank I did. Also, you told I me that. I think plan value is wrong, <laughs> to be honest. All right. So we want that to be 3250 Okay. I agree with that. Uh, what's our actual cost? 12 plus 1 plus 1,000 plus 750 plus 500. 3450 We agree with that? All right. So our what's our BAC? 6,000. It's 6 times 1,000. 6,000. What is our CV? Mine is wrong. What is yours? It's negative 200, not yeah, 425, right? right? Yeah. Negative 200. Okay. Uh, CPI is what? 3250 three, two, five, divided by 3450 is point what? 0.94. What does that mean? We're behind. We're making 94 cents on every dollar we spend. Right, that's what that means. Okay. The SV is 3250 minus 3,000. My number's wrong. What's the right number? 250. All right. So the SPI is 3250 divided by 3,000. That is what? 1.08. 1.08. Your EAC is? $6,382.97. So that is 6,000 divided by 0.94, right? Correct. Okay. And that number is what? Okay, and then we have the ETC is that number minus 3450. $3,932.97. And so how much cash are we off? Say that $382.97. $382.97. Okay, well done. Uh, you guys, if you all got those answers, and you found my mistake, you've earned a day off. Of <laughs> so we don't have to do that? No, you got to do that. <laughs> you can do it on Saturday, though. You don't have to do it on Tuesday night. Uh, all right. Uh, so there are a couple more formulas we could use, but can you see right now, at first it's kind of hard to get your mind around it because these variables have weird, weird variable names. But once you've looked at what it is with two practical examples, it's pretty straightforward. And if you have this information to go to your boss and say, guess what, based on where we are right now, we're two months behind. Or better yet, based on what we got right now, we're driving this baby, we're ahead. And here's, here's, here's what we've got, this is benefit. And so that shows us it's better managerial control. Uh, not, only, uh, not only does it have practical purposes for the costing and, and payment of all this stuff, it shows positive on our ability to be a leader. And that's what project management is about, right? That's what we're trying to do is get better at what we do even if we don't fully have the title. The principles work just the same whether you have the title or not. You can, you can get, you can get uh, a scoreboard together of where you're at with your project based on what your original plans were. Now, the one, one battle, and we're done, uh, that we face a lot of times is we work for bosses that don't let us, don't give us actual budgets on stuff. They go, well, see what you can do, do the best you can. That's a, not a project that you can manage now. You can do that part, but you can't run costs. You can't run, you don't know if you've got to win. You don't know when your boss is gonna pat you on the back and say, that's a great job. You came in better than I, I thought we would be able to. So try to move away from uh, Lucy goosey specifications, they almost always will get you in trouble. So, so a way now that you have this tool, you can say, I need some numbers. I need to some, put some numbers. And these numbers need to be dollar numbers and days. So we can say, based on our plans, so we can keep track of how are we doing. And if you get a reputation in your company of being able to convert uh, wishful thinking on the part of the management team into actual reality by helping them put real numbers and time to things, you will, you will be um, in the front of their mind for raises, for, for promotions, for more responsibility in the company because you are getting things done that they want done. And, and so that's a way to, to stand out, if you would, amongst the crowd because uh, if you can do things like manage projects uh, successfully, 
they don't know what you do. They don't know how you do it. They don't really care. All they know is that when they give you the assignment, you convert it into some something that happens, something that gets done. And that's the people that I want on my team. I, that's talent, and uh, that's that's uh, that's how you win uh, Super Bowl games, I guess. Speaking of which, there's probably a game on right now, right? Yeah. Who's playing? Uh, it's the Patriots and the Bills, actually. Okay. All right. Are they in in uh, Boston or? Uh, I think it's in. Uh, Okay, yeah, I just wondered if Buffalo was still snowed in. We're done, though. Thank you all. Don't forget, uh, Brad, you weren't here. Uh, we have an assignment online. Next Tuesday, there's no class here. Uh, there's an assignment online. Everybody else can go. I'll give Brad the details on that assignment. Uh, have a great weekend. Uh, we will see you one week from today, and you will have your assignment done uh, with the top five things that you got from that project. Thank you much.